the uh, the reality is that as we as we consider this particular subject, there are very few, I think, even in the professing church, and I'm using that term very broadly there. There are very few in the professing church, even in the United States, that really believe uh, what the Christian faith is saying took place. The Christian faith does not say on what day this took place. But could I mention just in passing, please, 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 don't be one of these people. There are so many uh, who, who repeat this, but we've all heard it, and it's, and it's, just, it's just become so commonplace that everybody thinks it's true because they never hear any, any opposition to it. But please don't give in to this cultural norm that, well, you know, uh, the Christians just borrowed this from the pagans, you know. I mean, Mithraism, you know, December 25th is the birthday of Mithras. And, uh, and so they just, you know, they borrowed it and they just sort of incorporated it in. That's baloney. There's just, it, it, it is historically naive to believe that. I know it's repeated all the time. But the very fact that it's repeated all the time is the only reason it's repeated all the time, is that everybody just figures that it's a, it's a given thing, and it's not. It's not the case. I mean, the idea that, that the Christians would have any desire to borrow from a dying religion that didn't even have any impact, was still developing in uh, Palestine at the time of the, uh, of the ministry of Paul and the apostles and things like that, uh, but it was passing away. Christianity was on the rise, at least culturally, at that particular point in time, after 313. The idea that they somehow said, hey, let's borrow this from the pagans. and but It just doesn't make any sense. And there's a fascinating article. I, I didn't grab the book out of my library, but I, I mention it probably every year. But track down the article by uh, Dr. Beckwith, not the converted back to Romanism Beckwith. Uh, but the historian Beckwith, uh, where he, uh, he's the one who wrote the work on the Old Testament canon and the New Testament church, uh, which is uh, Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament canon and the New Testament church, right, which we have, I believe, yes? Beckwith, yes, we have that uh, in, the, uh, in the thing. And uh, uh, check out the article that he wrote on the dating of... Zechariah's ministry um, in the temple and how that might be related to yes yes that's it still in still in packs there huh? um, and it's it's Roger isn't it yeah Roger Beckwith okay Old Testament Canon New Testament Church by the way I, I mean if you've got some if you've got some extra oh oh oh, 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 oh. <laughs> You too can have a three pack of Roger Beckwith. No, we'll unpack it. Yourself. Yes, we we will pack them uh, uh, separately. But it's uh, nice on your shelf that way. Uh, that does keep them in good shape. Yes, and uh, dust free as well. Um, anyway, Roger Beckwith uh, article on that subject is very interesting because it basically um, tends towards substantiating the original date which is very early attested, which is the Eastern Orthodox date uh, for Christmas, and that is uh, January 6th. Um, fascinating stuff. And, of course, the 12 days of Christmas is December 25th to January 6th. That's the 12 days. Um, and uh, so there's, you know, when people go, well, we just know it wasn't December. Or, you know, I was listening to some, I was listening to Barry Young here locally, you know, and he's like, well, everybody knows that. And I'm just like, I don't know that. But the reason I don't know that is because I've probably done more reading on it than uh, most people ever consider doing in that particular subject. But someday I'm just going to do a whole discussion of that. Anyway, leaving all of that aside, the, the incarnation itself, you know, the Eastern Orthodox talk a lot about it. The Eastern Orthodox probably a little imbalanced on it. But I think there's some truth to the idea that the East is imbalanced toward the Incarnation, the West toward the crucifixion and resurrection, 
the West towards soteriology, the East toward, well, they have a concept called theosis, uh, participation in the divine nature. They have a very weak doctrine of sin in comparison to the West. We need to be balanced. But I do seem to sense, especially amongst Western Christians, a de-emphasis upon the Incarnation and upon Trinitarianism as a whole. There really seems to be a de-emphasis upon uh, those issues. And I see a meaningful biblical celebration of the very invasion of God into his own creation as a appropriate uh, matter for the attention of God's people. Now, obviously, that means that a lot of the other trappings can be a distraction. But certainly, as I have spoken on the subject over the years, uh, one of my favorite things to do when I do have the opportunity of speaking is, is going to the, the prophetic passages, going to Isaiah chapter 9, uh, talking about a, a child to be born to us, natural terms, Yelid and Yelad, the very same root that's found in the Quran in, in Surah uh, 112. Uh, he begetteth not, neither is begotten. Well, long before Surah 112 came along, what would that be? 1,300 years prior to Surah 112, Isaiah had used those very same roots uh, to say to us, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. And uh, uh, I, I love going to the prophetic testimony, something I think Western Christians tend to be really weak on. We, we tend not to be able to do what the early church did and, and be able to preach the gospel from the Old Testament text because we tend to be canonically challenged. But I go to the, the prophetic text, and then I go, I, I really think that, that one of the reasons that the great high Christological texts in the New Testament tend to be remote to us, they don't... They don't tend to be the, the primary text that we, uh, we would put in our list of favorites is because, in essence, we do allow a division to take place in our thinking between the Christ of Bethlehem and the Christ of the cross, and then, and then there's really a distance to the Christ of, say, the book of Revelation, who rules the rod of iron, who, who has a, the sword coming forth in his mouth, and and, uh, and rules over the nations. <clears throat> we tend to, um, you know, one's a little more acceptable to us because it's not, it's not challenging to us. Um, we, like the, we like the baby Jesus. There are a lot of people who like the baby Jesus because the baby Jesus isn't going to judge us. But the Jesus of Revelation is judge, and he, uh, he has wrath against sin. And we just figure that Jesus is just simply the reconciler. Well, yeah, for those who have faith. Um, but it's, 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 it's putting all of the faith together. <clears throat> it's putting all of this together that's, that's most important. And um, I think this is a great time of year to emphasize the, the amazing condescension that is demonstrated in the incarnation. And that then requires us to have the highest view of Christ. And so... Uh, for example, um, I think one of the, one of the great uh, Christmas passages is Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Uh, when, it, when it talks about the, the fact that he has transferred us, uh, he's, he's rescued us from the domain of darkness, he's transferred us, um, he's the one that did this, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Once he mentions his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Then you have this great pastor starting Colossians 1.15. Um, he is the image of invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Firstborn does not mean first created thing. And then for by him were all things created, whether in heaven or earth, visible, invisible, principalities, powers, dominions, authorities, all things created by him, for him, he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. They consist. And yes, I believe that is a Christmas passage. Because again, when you recognize the unity and harmony and oneness of Christian truth, then you see you cannot possibly have the, that kind of, of text 
um, without understanding who Jesus really is and the fact that he was the God-man. And almost all heresies that have cropped up in the history of the Christian church have been heresies that have missed somewhere the balance that is necessary to affirm positively everything that the Bible teaches about Jesus. There's so much. I mean, what, what, do I, what am I always saying to my, <clears throat> to my uh, Muslim friends? They will, I mean, you can always tell a Muslim who has never opened their mind to Christian teaching on the subject of Jesus when they, for example, uh, will quote John chapter 5. I was listening to, uh, I was listening to Nabil Qureshi giving a presentation at, I think, the University of Georgia while writing yesterday. It's one of the many things I listened to. And there were some Muslims in the audience, and when you listen to their objections, it is very easy for me now to tell when I am talking to a Muslim who understands what we believe and objects to it, or the Muslim who does not understand what we believe and is simply repeating the objections they think are valid based upon the teaching they've received within Islam. They've, they've never opened their minds to really understand what we believe. You can always tell the difference. And, some of the, some of the, and both the individuals in the audience uh, in this particular thing I was listening to you know, demonstrated that. One of them quoted from John chapter 5. You know, well, didn't Jesus say this? Well, I, you know, I, I just got the real strong feeling he'd never read John chapter 5 because there'd just be too much in John chapter 5 he couldn't accept. But, well, I, I do nothing, but what I've seen the Father do, I can do nothing of myself, et cetera, et cetera. That means he can't be God. In the, in the same way, most of the time, what you'll hear from a Muslim will be, well, look, look what it says here in Acts. A man testified uh, by God to have done this, that, and the other thing, as if we don't believe Jesus is a man. He is a prophet, as if we don't believe Jesus is a prophet. Every false view of Christ that has cropped up over the years has been due to an imbalance, an unwillingness to allow Jesus to be more than that particular teacher would allow him to be. So you end up, well, well, he's a prophet, and so he's only a prophet. He's a man, so he's only a man. He's a king, so he's only a king. No, it's all of it together. It's all of it together. And if you don't have a real incarnation, then you don't really have the fullness. It's the same thing in regards to the new attacks uh, coming out of England on the virgin birth based upon a poor view of the Bible. The idea that, well, only certain authors mentioned this, therefore, um, it would be easier for us if we didn't believe this, so, uh, and we don't have to worry about this harmonization thing, you know, let's not, let's not worry about harmony, harmonizing Scripture. Um, let's, let's, let's take a different view. Let's, uh, uh, let's allow Scripture to be torn up into various parts and pieces, and that's a, that's just the, the very foundation of what you have in so much of liberalism. But that stuff's out there. And without a virgin birth, w- without the historical reality of when the incarnation takes place, you would not have the Christian doctrine that gives us hope and peace. And so I, I do not apologize uh, for gathering with my family uh, tonight and tomorrow and thinking on these things and, and celebrating and reminding ourselves once again that light has come into the world. And that, how, how bright was that light? And I, I do not uh, apologize to the secular naturalist who thinks I should be out duck hunting in camo with a long beard if I actually believe in the Christmas stories. You really think angels appeared to shepherds? I mean, come on. 
Yeah. You, you know, you know, have you ever thought about that particular story? Doesn't it strike you as a little bit strange they appeared to shepherds? I mean, I think if you were writing this, the angels would appear to Herod, and they would appear to the powerful and to the mighty and to the people in the great places of, of uh, intellectual and cultural learning, not to a bunch of smelly shepherds that had never even heard of antiperspirant or deodorant. But that's who they came to. And you see, what it does is it tells us that what the rest of the New Testament says is true. God chooses those who are not. He chooses those who do not have power, the non-well-born, to make foolish those who think they're wise. Uh, So yeah, I think angels can appear to shepherds. And I believe that... um, I believe that wise men can follow a star. Oh, yeah, the moving star story. Boy, you people are stupid. It's a miracle, guys. I mean, I know there's some really interesting stuff about what was going on at that time period and that there had been a a, a lunar eclipse. And, you know, there, there may be some interesting stuff there. But when you boil it all down, it was a supernatural event. And if... And if they were the only ones who could see it, I don't care. The point was they were led there. Are you telling me God cannot do that? He created the stars in the heavens. He created us. And you're saying it's beyond his ability. Let's say it was just a vision. Let's say it was just a vision that is given only to these men. God can't do that. That's beyond God's capacity. Well, you know, from a historical perspective, yeah, if you're a naturalistic historian who absolutely excludes the possibility of God's existence and intervention in history, then you're not going to believe these things. But then there's all sorts of stuff that happened in history that you have no answers for, and you just simply have to say is really strange. Okay. But you can't say that in a supernatural context that God could not do that. Or that God could not warn Joseph in a dream. Or that, or that the differences between Matthew and Luke in the information they record isn't relevant to the sources they were using and the audiences that were theirs. As if they had to be, well, I was about to say CNN reporters, but they're about as unbiased as I don't know what anyways. So um, they have to somehow uh, uh, record only what you would see on a video camera or on a, on a, here on an MP3 player. That's not what they were doing. That's not what anybody was doing back then. So yeah, I believe all those things. And and I am not embarrassed by it. And I recognize that in the vast majority of instances in the media today, when those types of questions are asked, they're not being asked so that I could actually give a full answer, one that's consistent with my worldview that would challenge somebody else's world. But it, I, I know why they're ask, asking those questions and the way they're asking them. I understand that. I understand that. And I am confident that in a context where truth could be spoken, I could give a good reason for why I believe what I believe and that it's appropriate to believe those things. Um, Even if it's pretty rare these days that we are given those types of opportunities uh, to actually answer those things. 